All right, so let's continue with a different topic. Uh, this now is design patterns. This will also be spread out over several parts. And first of all, let's have a look at what design patterns are in general. So you can think of these as kind of recipes for problems that come up again and again. And design patterns can be available on quite a few different levels. So you can have design patterns for the user interface, like for the graphical representation. You can have very high level design patterns for the system architecture. Um, and you can have lower level design patterns for the implementation. Um, these patterns are often actually not uh, described with any code. Uh, often they're just UML diagrams and maybe a few code examples, but they're not like libraries, which you can just drop into your project and use. Um, they are some th something like blueprints, which you can follow for, for solving specific problems. Um, for the architectural patterns, you'll often see just the very simple type of box and line diagram, uh, which isn't even a strict UML or anything like that, just a really high level rough sketch of how the individual major components of the, the system relate to each other. Um, and for most design patterns, you'll find some of the following aspects in a, in a description, especially if you're looking into the so-called Gang of Four book. We're going to talk about that later. So, of course, we need some kind of motivation and a description of where that problem happens, which the, where the application area is. Then a description of the, the actual solution of the pattern itself. Um, there's often a, a class diagram, as I already mentioned, um, then sometimes also a sequence diagram to describe how the individual objects interact with each other and a bit of additional background on what the individual classes and, and operations do. And in many cases, um, it's not like that uh, once again, such a pattern is a solution for everything. There are specific constraints you have to consider, and so they most of them have advantages as well as disadvantages, which you have to to uh, keep in mind. Um, sometimes they depend on other patterns um, and uh, what anything else that that needs to be discussed is usually in there too. So um, this is uh, usually true for any uh, pattern, and um, in fact. The fundamental idea of using these patterns doesn't come from, from software or from computer science at all, but this is something that originated in architecture and in, in civil engineering. So there was a book from 1977 from an architect, uh, Christopher Alexander, and this is called A Pattern Language. And um, here's a quote from the book, uh, each pattern describes a problem that you will encounter over and over again, and then describes a common solution. Um, so the important part is you will never apply exactly the same solution twice usually. So depending on the context, your solution will always look a little bit different, but at the core of the solution, you will find the same pattern once again. And this is the, the fundamental idea for construction and for architecture as well as for for software architecture and for software development and and computer science um, so here's uh, two examples from this book and those of course uh, relate to architecture so for example um, one is related to, to uh, designing a, a house for a family. And he, here the fundamental idea is that people need a bit of space to be together, but also space to, to be alone. And so the, the fundamental solution is simply to give each family member uh, a room of their own. Um, and there's thousands of possible solutions how exactly to to build this uh, it will look a little different in every house but the fundamental idea and the uh, the problem this solves is uh, always the same um, and on a different level uh, for uh, for city planning for for uh, urban planning for, uh, you have this pattern called nine percent parking which is quite obvious so um, if you have two large areas uh, which are just parking lots then um, your city will kind of fall in fall apart into individual parts that don't really relate to each other so you should um, 
limit that to something like like nine percent. So one drawback of this uh, aspect here of this pattern is maybe that it doesn't describe how they arrived at this figure of nine percent. Maybe uh, this is still a little high uh, and we should try to reduce that but in general it's also a pattern that you can apply to just about any urban planning context and this is the background of uh, how um, these patterns then later merged into computer science because there also we have similar problems occurring again and again and all of them often share a common solution and that's what these patterns describe. All right, so first of all, let's talk about the architectural patterns. These are at a very high level and they provide an overview over the entire system. Um, they can overlap, so it's not like you have to select exactly one of them and some parts of the system can correspond to one part or to one architectural pattern and other parts can correspond to another one or you can even have two separate views corresponding to two different patterns for the same, uh, for the same software system. Um, and here is a few examples that I'd like to uh, briefly discuss and, and introduce so you, uh, so you have heard of them. A really widely used pattern uh, for, uh, for the system architecture is the model view controller. This is especially suitable for things that have a, a user facing component, some kind of user interface. And uh, as you can already guess, there's three components. One is the model, which is basically the, the management of the data, the, often the database actually. Then you have the view, that's what the user sees and uh, what the user interact with, interacts with. And um, last but not least, we have the controller, which takes input commands from the user and then forwards these to the model or adjusts the view accordingly. And so the big advantage of this model view controller is that you can have uh, data and pres presentation independent from each other. Um, so for example, you can have uh, for, for some kind of distributed application, you can have a web view of the data and you can have a mobile app that's also a view of the data. Um, and uh, if you now write that application for Android or iOS, for example, doesn't really make a difference because the rest of the system, the model and the controller can basically stay the same. You can, you just need to, to you can add different views basically. So there it's also possible to have more than one view, of course. Um, on the other hand, if you only have a very simple data model, then following the whole model view controller architecture can, add quite a bit of complexity that you maybe don't even need. So if you think about using an iterative development approach, then it's usually considered not a good idea to, to add complexity upfront, even if you don't need it yet. So uh, for, a, for a simple prototype, model view controller might actually be overkill. But um, as soon as your system gets a bit more complex, then it can often be a good idea to, to follow this pattern. So uh, as a graphical illustration, well, we have the model, which is the, the um, database in the, in the most abstract sense. Then whenever the database changes, then the view or the views, multiple views are possible, these are updated. Then this is something the user can, can um, perceive and act on basically. And then the commands from the user are uh, interpreted by the controller and that in turn changes the data model. So this is uh, the loop basically that model view controller forms. Um, one very simple example would be to consider the backend in a, in a web application as the model. So the MySQL database or whatever, then the web browser is basically corresponding to the view and the web server, Apache or whatever is the, the controller. So that's one possible way to, to uh, interpret the different components in a, in a regular web application as model view controller. There's a couple of other uh, examples I'd briefly like to discuss. So um, a website in itself can also be considered to, to follow this approach. So the HTML content is the actual data, the model. 
Then CSS, the, the styling part, uh, is the view, which actually like decides how the, the data is presented, basically. And the browser is kind of the glue in between the controller that brings these things together. Um, similar in an Android app, actually. So we have an internal database, that's the model. We have the uh, user interface fragments. These are the, the different views on the data. And we have the Java code in between. That's uh, the, the controller, basically. And if you have a web application, I already talked about that you could, for example, view the entire backend as the model, um, the browser is the view, and the web server, uh, Apache, is the controller. Um, or you can actually have a secondary view, which is quite as valid, maybe, where the date, only the database itself is the model. Um, the browser is still the view, but if you have, for example, a PHP application that's um, controlling access to the database, then you can consider that to be the controller um, and the web server is just kind of a support a support layer, for example. So there's quite, quite a, a number of different interpretations possible, um, but these are a couple of examples of how model view controller is, is actually um, is actually used in a common user interface um, systems. All right. Another uh, architectural pattern is the client server architecture. So here the fundamental idea is that we split uh, all functionality into services and for each of these services we have a server. This doesn't have to correspond to one to one uh, to a physical server that's mounted in a rack somewhere so we can also have logical servers um, but in both cases the two big advantages are that we can um, access data basically from anywhere and um, we can also easily do load balancing. So if we just uh, start up additional copies of one of these services, then we can um, handle a lot more connections without really having to change anything in, the, in our architecture. So of course, the advantage is this is distributed uh, per se, and it's network transparent. So it's easily easy to put this into different data centers, for example. Um, and so on, this basically comes at no additional cost. Um, the drawback is, if, at least if we don't have uh, replication, then each service is kind of a single point of failure. Uh, as long as the whole system depends on that service, then if that machine goes down, then your whole system will stop. And also, especially if you have a distributed system with several data centers, for example, then the performance of the, the network connections is something that's hard to predict, especially if it's shared with other services, other customers maybe even. Um, so this might, even if each of your services is working perfectly on its own, if the communication is, is too slow, then this might still be an issue for your system. Um, all right, so as a diagram, of course, this is very simple. We have a network, we have individual services, uh, doesn't really have to be one server on its own. They can all, for example, run on the same hardware and are just virtual servers. And then we have uh, a lot of clients which connect to each of these servers. And as you can, uh, of course, it's easy to imagine that if the video server is particularly uh, under high demand, then we can just an, a second video server and uh, split the clients evenly among them. Of course, the network load will go up. So this is always something we have to keep in mind. Um, when we are talking about networks, then layered architecture is also an important, uh, an important architectural pattern to keep in mind. And so this architecture always views uh, the entire system as a stack of layers that are connected with, with each other. And uh, in, in a strict sense, every layer only communicates with the ones on, uh, on top uh, and on the bottom. And the complexity usually is uh, growing from, from bottom to top. So the topmost layer is the most complex ones. And um, many network protocols are uh, actually designed in such a layered architecture. I'll show you an example in a moment. Um, big advantage is that you can 
easily swap out a layer and the the interface specification is basically already built in so um, for each layer it has to somehow communicate with the ones on top on and on bottom so there has to be a way to pass data between them and if that's specified then you can just uh, swap out uh, one layer for a different implementation and everything should still run like it did before on the other hand it can sometimes be quite hard to actually separate uh, functionality into such layers. I'll show you an example. So if we uh, want to describe a user interface, a web application as this sort of layered architecture, that's of course possible. So at the lowest layer, we have the um, support layer, the operating system, maybe some kind of uh, hardware abstraction layer. Then on top of that, we have the database. Then we have, for example, a PHP application that's communicating with the database. and on the topmost layer, we have the browser that's then displaying the data from the web application. Um, one question now is, if you want a separate layer for security features, where should we put that? Is it something in between the web application and the database, or is it in between the browser and the web application? So this is actually mm, features like security that you often uh, go across several layers. This is quite hard to represent in this sort of layered architecture. But there's an example where uh, this layered approach is really um, widely used and this is networking. So um, so there's for example the ISO network model, you might already have heard of this and this kind of represents any sort of network communication as a stack of seven layers. So there's the physical layer, the data link, the network layer and so on. And for two sides of the communication, basically for two communication partners, it always looks like, for example, the application layer on site B is talking directly to the application layer on site A. In reality, it's just talking to the presentation layer below, and then that is talking to the session layer, and so first the data is passed down through the, the stack on one side, and then the actual communication is happening on the physical layer, where the actual data is being sent and then on the other side it's passed back up through the uh, individual layers of the stack until it reaches the application layer again. But uh, the application layers don't actually know about the rest of the stack below them so from their point of view it seems like they're directly talking to the application layer on the other side. Same for the presentation session and so on for all the other layers. The only ones that are actually directly communicating with each other are the, the physical layer components. Um, so this is a rather rather abstract approach. Now let's have a look at how this uh, looks like for the internet. Uh, so let's assume that you're um, opening a web page over HTTPS uh, using a Wi-Fi connection, then these six protocols will be involved. So at the very bottom, we have the, the wireless hardware. This is the physical layer. Then on top of that data link layer, in our case, will then be this Wi-Fi protocols, which handle connection to the access point and so on. Then the network layer is simply IP, the internet protocol. Um, the transport layer is TCP, transmission control protocol. This handles, for example, retransmission of lost packets and so on. This is not something that IP, the internet protocol, can do on its own. IP will just transport data packets from A to B. It doesn't care about the order of the packets or whether they actually arrive. This is handled by a TCP. Then on top of that, we can have the, the session, for uh, as an example for the session layer, we can have TLS. This is an encryption layer, a separate one. And then on top of that, we have HTTP, which is hypertext transfer protocol, which is then corresponding to both the application and the presentation layer. So this is not exactly a one-to-one -one match, but uh, these six protocols are, for example, involved if you open a, a secure website over a Wi-Fi connection. All right. So one important thing to to keep in uh, keep in mind is when you have such a, a layered stack of network protocols, then uh, the the data packets itself are kind of nested into each other. You can also think of Russian dolls, maybe. And so each packet has an, a header and it has a payload. The payload is 
just data that the actual um, that the layer doesn't look at. So each layer just looks at its own header, uh, does something with the, with the data in the header, and then passes on the rest of the packet to the next layer. And um, each uh, each layer basically contains as its payload uh, the entire packet, including the header of the uh, next protocol in the stack. So the outermost uh, packet is the physical layer packet and contained in that one is the link layer control packet. And in that we have the IP packet and so on. Then comes the TCP packet, the TLS packet. Oops, sorry. Why does that work? Okay, the TLS packet and then inside the TLS packet, the HTTP packet and last but not least, the actual data that's being transferred via HTTP. All right, so this was an overview over how um, how layered architecture maps to network communication, for example. So now let's look at another architectural pattern, which is the repository pattern. Here, the fundamental idea is that all data is inside a repository, some central database, and even though the system can have quite a number of components, they don't interact uh, with each other directly. They all communicate through the repository. Um, the big advantages, of course, the components are more or less independent. Um, the interface is quite, quite clear because they only have to communicate with the um, repository itself. And it's also very easy to make a backup, for example, because you just have to make a copy of the one repository. Um, on the other hand, um, you have a single point of failure once again with the repository, of course. If that is down, then the rest of the system won't work either. And um, if you want to have a, a synchronous or, or a concurrent access to that repository, then you have to deal with uh, synchronization between the individual, individual components, and that might be difficult uh, once again. So. One example for this repository pattern would be a computer-aided software engineering system. And one example, which most of you will probably have used already, is Eclipse. So there you have at the center of the, the architectural design, you have the repository for each project. And then um, the UML editor talks to that and the code generator, the, the Java editor, the compiler. If you have a code analyzer, if you have a debugger, all of these always go through the um, project repository. And this is a fundamental uh, approach that many such systems actually use. So you, you have a central repository and a bit of glue code, so to say, and then you have many, many plugins that all together then form the whole um, IDE system, for example. All right. Um, one other uh, architectural pattern I'd like to mention is the pipe and filter architecture. This is especially uh, useful if you do things like uh, audio processing or computer vision or also text processing. Um, so you have a lot of components which kind of all have the same interface, uh, which are sometimes called filters and which transform the data in some way. And in between each component, you have a pipe, so-called data flow pipe. And um, yeah, these together form a network which transforms your data actually in real time uh, in many cases. Sometimes this is also called a data flow architecture. Um, big advantages since you have a very simple and very clearly defined interface it's very easy to extend and write a new plugin for that and you can um, match that with many things in the real world like for example video processing pipelines and so on um, a disadvantage is that if your data stays in the same format throughout the whole processing uh, pipeline, then uh, this is very straightforward. However, if your data has to be converted on the fly and maybe even several times, then this can uh, use up quite a bit of, um, of computing resources, which of course isn't uh, such, uh, such a big advantage here. So, one example of this pipe and filter architecture here is from um, the Microsoft um, 
I think direct show system. So here you have basically a camera which uh, provides a audio video stream. Then you have a splitter which uh, separates that into the video stream and the audio stream. Then you have T components which um, basically duplicate the stream. Um, the output of these T's is then sent to the audio output and the video output component. And um, the other output of both uh, of both both T's is sent to a, mu a multiplexer, and the result of that is sent to a file. So your uh, the end result is that you can uh, you're previewing uh, video and audio at the same time as it's written um, written to a file in a in a container format. Um, in general, when selecting an architecture, then there are uh, several considerations you want to keep in mind. So, for example, if you uh, want high performance, then it's usually a good idea to pick an architecture with few big components that don't do a lot of communication in between the components and that all the uh, performance critical things are, are handled internally, basically. Um, if you want security, then it might be a good idea to use a layered architecture. This is quite difficult sometimes, as I've already mentioned. But uh, if you have basically several layers of access control on top, then you can put your actual critical data into one of the lower layers where it's actually hard to, to, to get to in a sense. Um, if you uh, need to be concerned about safety, then uh, it's a good idea to, to localize that into a very few subsystems. So not try to spread it out too much. Uh, use also like with performance, use an architecture with large grain components um, that you can um, they can control more easily and uh, basically not spread out the, the important parts over too many subsystems. Um, if you need availability, so uh, then you need also some kind of redundancy usually. For that case, an architecture which contains easily duplicated components like client-server architecture is maybe a good idea. And last but not least, if the focus is on maintainability, then you should have clear interfaces with uh, uh, components that are as small as possible and that can be easily replaced without having to, to uh, change a lot regarding the interface.